Coriolis effect, Kestrel meters, and vertical grips, this week on Mail Call Mondays. We're here on another Monday. I hope all of you guys had a great Thanksgiving this last week. I know I ended up stuffing myself for several days, so now we get back into our regular work week again, and we're going to kick it off this week with some more great questions. Our first question of the week comes from Sean. Sean asks, 6.5 millimeter Creedmoor or 7 millimeter 08? Well, Sean, the problem that we run into when we try to compare different cartridges like the 6.5 Creedmoor and 7mm 08 is there is a vast array of high ballistic coefficient bullets in both of those uh, cartridges or both of those bullet diameters and then we have a pretty wide array of powders to choose for those. So it's really difficult to get a quantifiable comparison between the two. Uh, you may have some bullets in the 6.5 that you can drive fairly fast, which have a relatively high ballistic coefficient, and then you try to compare them to bullets in the 7mm class that also have a very high ballistic coefficient that you may be able to not drive quite as quickly. So really, it just you're going to go back and forth and back and forth on them. When you're comparing cartridges like this, what you need to do is talk to guys that have actually shot the two and have run the two for an extensive period, at least for a year, so you get varying different temperature levels, varying different situations that they run them in. And then ask them what bullet and what powder they've had good luck with. And then ask several other shooters the same thing. And then try to compare those bullets and those powders between the two. It's not something that is a quick process. Unfortunately, I don't really have a whole lot of experience with the 7mm 08. I've shot the 243, I've shot the 260, uh, and of course quite a bit of 308 shooting, but not really so much in the uh, 7 millimeter calibers. But when we pull the numbers and we do the numbers based upon uh, velocity and ballistic coefficients out there, you can see that it really just goes back and forth. Those two cartridges are really neck and neck. And that's part of the reason that I don't have a lot of experience with the 7 millimeter 08 because it doesn't give me a massive advantage over some of the other stuff that I have right now. So it really is going to be a numbers game. Be careful if you're comparing book values, uh, book velocities, and book ballistic coefficients, because sometimes they don't tell the full tale. Uh, there are guys out there that are running considerably faster velocities than the book maximums, and sometimes the ballistic coefficients are a little bit inflated for advertising values. So when you're comparing the ballistic coefficients, you want to get something like uh, the Applied Ballistics Handbook that Brian Litz has put out and check the Litz ballistic coefficients for the different bullets. And then you also are really going to want to take a look at what velocities different shooters are getting out of different barrel lengths to give you an idea of what realistic velocities are for those bullets. Now when you're comparing them, don't just take the fastest velocity that you've heard of a guy get because he may be running the ragged edge of pressure, he may actually be causing damage to his rifle while he's shooting those velocities. So don't just take the fastest uh, velocity you get and say that's what I'm going to base my decision on. You really want to look at a range of velocities, at a range of barrel lengths, and then take a look there. So I hope that gives you a little bit of idea on what to look at when comparing those two. Our next question comes from Nathan. Nathan asks, what kind of accuracy can you expect out of the box with the Remington 700 Varmint versus the Remington 700 AAC SD? Well, Nathan, first of all, you got to remember both these rifles are factory rifles. The barrels have a tolerance specification on them, and when we're looking at the barrels themselves, although one is a 1 in 10, uh, 12 twist, the Varmint is a 1 in 12 twist, and the ACSD is a 1 in 10 twist, they are still made on the same uh, machines, the same production line, and in the same manner. There's slightly different tooling for the two since they're both hammer forged. The actual mandrel that they're forged over has to be different for the different rifling speeds. But they're still chambered in the same manner, they're still screwed on to the actions in the same manner. So when we're comparing 
barrel to action to barrel to action, there's very little difference between the two. It's more about what the stage of where the tooling was in, when the barrel was made, uh, how much care was taken when it was actually being installed. Is it a Monday gun? Is it a Friday gun? Uh, you know, it really that's where your accuracy is going to come from then. Now, when we compare the stocks, the AAC SD stock has a higher potential for accuracy because you're talking about a composite stock that has aluminum pillars in it. Those aluminum pillars allow you to get a more accurate torque value when you're torquing the action into the stock. The Varmint rifle has just an injection molded stock. There are no pillars. So if you crunch down that torque too much, you can actually compress the stock and this will affect your torque values. This will affect how the rifle sits in the stock. Both of the stocks are not really exceptional quality. The Remington Varmint stock has two polymer pads at the end of the uh, stock, the end of the forend, that actually touch the underside of the barrel. The AACSD stock uses a Hogue overmolded stock that is designed to be free floating. Unfortunately, what we found time and time again is that when you put a bipod on that stock and then you load the bipod, the fore end of the stock will compress down and that will touch the barrel. So neither sto the stocks are really good free floating stocks. So they're kind of a wash there. What I would base my decision on more than accuracy potential between the two is if you need a threaded barrel to mount a suppressor. If you need a threaded barrel to mount a suppressor, then the AACSD is the way to go because the price difference between the two is not more than what it generally would cost for you to send the rifle out, have it cut and threaded for a suppressor and have a uh, thread protector made up for it. So when you factor that in, the ACSD is the way to go. What I tell guys is if you are trying to really push the limits of the 308 cartridge, if you're trying to get the most velocity and most range out of it possible, then the 26 inch barrel on the Remington 700 Varmint will work better for you. So take those two factors into mind and assume that the actual accuracy between the two is gonna be a wash. Depending upon the day they're made, one day the Varmint may be more accurate than the ACSD. Coming off the next line, the AAC may be more accurate than the Varmint. So it's just a back and forth game. Gene asks, could you explain the Coriolis effect and when it is important slash unimportant, take into consideration when shooting or making calculations? Well, as we all know from the day and night change, the Earth is rotating. And what the Coriolis effect is, is when that Earth rotates, things attached to the ground will rotate at a different rate than things that are not attached to the ground. We are attached to the ground, our target is attached to the ground. When we fire the rifle and launch the bullet out of the muzzle, the bullet is no longer attached to the ground. It's free to move on its own regardless of the rotation of the earth. Now when you fire the bullet, there is still momentum. It's kind of like if you roll down the window of a moving car and throw a ball out of it. That ball isn't going to suddenly stop and drop right to the ground. It's going to continue along the same direction of momentum that the car had, or direction of movement that the car had. The bullet is the same thing. When you fire the bullet, it's going to continue to track along with the motion of the shooter and the target, but that is going to degrade. Now because the earth rotates around its axis, then the effect on the bullet is going to be different if you're firing north to south or south to north versus east to west or west to east. So that's where the Coriolis calculations come into effect. It takes into account where you're at, where the target's at, the flight path of the bullet, and the movement of the earth relative to that flight path. It's really not something that is easy to crank out with pen and paper. It's something that's gonna require a ballistic calculator and it's gonna require a knowledge of where you're at and where the target's at. For shots that are you know, under a thousand yards and really for all realistic purposes I would say under 1400 yards I'm not gonna do a calculation for Coriolis I'm just not gonna worry about it the amount of variance 
for most uh, situations when you calculate Coriolis is going to be less than the error from calculating the environmental effects. If you're just slightly off on your wind call, very often you will have a much greater effect than not calculating Coriolis. So you can kind of wipe that out of your mind. Now, if you're shooting an extreme long range platform, if you're shooting a 50 BMG and you're shooting out to 2,400 yards, then factoring in Coriolis may be a good idea. And I would at least factor it in and see what the variation is before we start worrying about it. Uh, but if you're shooting really big guns like 155 millimeter howitzers, they need to calculate Coriolis because they are shooting those very large projectiles for several kilometers. So the longer your range is, the more flight time you're going to have, the more important it is to calculate Coriolis. For most of what we do for tactical rifle competitions, I don't worry about Coriolis at all. So I hope that gives you a little bit more of an idea. Uh, the best thing you can do is grab a ballistic calculator that can calculate Coriolis and just play with it and see what kind of results you get. It's really interesting when you start factoring in those values to see how much really has an effect on your bullet downrange and how much is just extra steps that you have to take before launching that bullet. Chad asks, vertical foregrip versus angle foregrip on an AR, what are the pros and cons of each? In what applications would you use one over the other? Well, Chad, back in the day when I built up my uh, patrol rifle, I put a vertical grip on it because I really like the ability to lock that forward hand in and to apply some rearward pressure with that forward hand. I felt it really helped me to transition left and right horizontally between targets. What I found though was that as I kept using the vertical foregrip, my hand kept creeping up higher and higher until I got to the point where my hand was in the crook of the vertical foregrip and the forend. So really I was angling it further forward and you start to inch that thumb forward. And this is especially true if you're a combat pistol shooter where you get really used to that thumbs forward angled grip. So it's a natural transition to that thumbs forward angled grip on a vertical foregrip. Now a Magpul released their angle foregrip, I looked at that and thought that's what I'm doing on the vertical grip anyway. I can go to an angle foregrip, I can get rid of that extra protrusion that's sticking down off the bottom of the rifle and clean up the forend a little bit. The other thing that I liked is when you're shooting with that angled foregrip, if you're actually taking a broomstick type grip on it, then it leaves your knuckles really badly exposed. And I switched to hard Kevlar knuckle gloves when we were doing entries because I would notice that every now and again you would come around a corner and you'd be pieing a corner really tight and you could grate your knuckles along that corner. And it just really isn't a good thing, especially when you've got a bunch of guys behind you. If you bounce your hand off that uh, door jam and you've got a guy behind you that slams into you, you can end up breaking knuckles really easily. So moving to that vertical grip is a little bit better. There's a little bit less force on your hand if you impact your hand into something. Since you're angled a little bit more, it's easier to slide over things. That's just kind of the way that I thought it out mentally, but once I started using the angled grips, I like that grip a little bit further. And when you think of the, the mechanics of it, when we're talking about your rear pistol grip hand, yeah, it's kind of, it's more vertical than what an angled grip would be, but that's because this elbow is dropped down here. If we take this hand and we just lock my wrist where it's at, and then we extend that hand, come from here and just extend that arm out, well, we have a more angled grip. We're not straight up and down like this. If I was straight up and down like this and I pulled that arm back in, then I would actually have a pistol grip that was swept forward. So it kind of makes sense with the mechanics of your body. I like that angle. I like punching that arm out and getting it locked in. Now one place where you do want to keep into consideration vertical grips versus an angle is if you start pulling it back in. Now when you start pulling that grip closer into you, if you're trying to angle it, you just really kink that wrist in a really uncomfortable position. So if you like to run with your elbows tucked in and your arms really close, 
then a more vertical hand position works better. In fact, most people that like to run with their elbows tucked in like that will just come back and get a magwell grip. They'll just grip the front of the magazine and the front of the magwell, and that's fine too. Tucks your arms in, keeps your arms down, keeps your body armor closed up, and keeps your body protected. So a lot of it is going to be personal preference. It's going to be how you run that gun. I like to have my arms a little bit more extended, so I like the vertical grip or the uh, angled foregrip. If you like to pull your arms in a little bit further, a vertical grip or even just a magwell hold may help you out. So you really need to try them both ways, run through some uh, drills and see which one works better for you. My preference now is for the angled foregrip. Sean asks, different Sean from the first Sean, I'm doing research on what caliber I would like my next rifle to be. I've settled on a 6.5 millimeter bullet, but I can't decide on the cartridge. Would you explain the differences and your opinions on the 6.5 Creedmoor 260 Remington 6.5 by 47 and the 6.5 by 55? Also, would you explain your reasoning on selecting the 260 Remington for your 6.5 millimeter build? Thanks as always, and great shows. Well, Sean, I'll take the last part of that question first. My reasoning for going with the 260 Remington on the build that we were doing is really twofold. First of all, I got a smoking deal on that prefit barrel. So really that, it would have cost four times as much to go with the 6.5 Creedmoor or one of the other 6.5 offerings versus just going with the 260 that it came pre-fit in. Uh, the second reason is I can go into any of our gun shops here in town and I can pick up 260 brass. Uh, not so much with 6.5 Creedmoor or the 6.5x47, 6.5x55. That stuff is not just on the shelf locally here. So while bullets and powder I can pick up anywhere, the brass would be my limiting factor there. And really, when you start comparing all of those, there are very little difference between those cartridges when we get into tactical shooting. A lot of those cartridges were designed either specifically for bench rest shooting, they had different tweaks to, to get just a little bit more powder or just a little bit more brass life out of them. And in the big picture, I don't think it matters really all that much. If you want to see a really good rundown of the differences between several of those, uh, Zach Smith wrote a great article on his website, and we will link to that down in the description below. So you can go read up on that. He is a whole lot more knowledgeable on the subject than I am. I tend to look and see what some of the front runners are running and then I'll experiment with that because I don't have vast resources and I don't have weeks to just go out and experiment with different cartridges. If I had a rifle shop in my backyard and I could spin up barrels whenever I wanted to spin up barrels then I would have a whole lot more freedom to try different barrels but when you're talking about $300 for a barrel blank. 300 to 350 to have a gunsmith install it, those experiments start to get a little expensive even when you don't factor in the cost of the brass and just the cost of the time to go throw expensive bullets and powder downrange. So I look at what the front runners are running. A lot of times I'll ask them why they're running that or why they chose that. And then take a look at the performance in my application and see how it works out. And the 260 was just a good fit for us. So go check out Zach's article and see which one of those will work out best for you. Eric asks, Leupold TMR versus Mill. Well, Eric, really the TMR is, in my opinion, a better option than the standard Mill dot reticle. They're both mill based reticles so they're both graduated in mill radians uh, but the TMR reticle breaks down that mill a little bit finer than you get with the mill dot. The mill dot the only way that you have to break it down really is the diameter of the mill dot itself to be able to look at that and see what half a mill dot is which half a mill dot will be 0.1 mil a full mill dot will be 0.2 mils and then from center of one mill dot to center of another mill dot is one mil. That is about all you get to break it down finer than that. You have to start really dividing that mill dot into smaller and smaller increments. 
I've done it for a very long time, so it's not a big deal for me to do it when I'm looking down range through it. And when I'm zeroing a mil dot based rifle scope, I can still get on it pretty quickly. But when you look at it compared to modern day reticles, such as the TMR and even more advanced reticles like the Horus reticles or the G2 DMR reticle out there, uh, those reticles really break that mill down so much finer and the scale makes it easier to quickly measure things downrange. So it allows you to more accurately and quickly measure splash offset from a target when you see it than you would if you had to try to uh, subdivide that regular mill dot. So my suggestion if you're really between those two is the TMR, but I think there are even better reticle options out there than the TMR. And if you're looking in the higher end loophole scopes, the Mark 8s and the Mark 6, uh, you can get the Horus reticles in those. So take a look at some of the Horus reticles out there. I'm not a great fan of all the Horus reticles, but there are a couple of them that do work very well. So take a look at those options. But I would not go with a standard mill dot reticle unless there was really no other mill based option out there. Sean asks, Lots of Sean's today. Sean asks, I'm reloading rounds and I have heard of case neck trimming. I haven't done that and I'm wondering if I should. What sign should I look for on the brass neck to let me know that the neck should be trimmed? Thanks. Well, Sean, what you really need to be doing is every time you're getting ready to prep those cases, you need to take out your caliper and you need to measure the case length. Bust open your book, and for whichever cartridge you're loading for, it should have a trim to length and a max length. Now, the max length is what you need to be careful of. You don't want those cases to be larger than the max length for that cartridge. Uh, when they reach the max length, then you need to trim them back to the trim to length. Brass will continue to grow as long as you're firing it and working it because the brass wants to flow forward. Um, now, if you're neck sizing, you will have less of a need. The brass will not grow as quickly because you're not stretching it out every time you resize it. You're just crunching the neck back down. But if you're full length resizing, it'll grow a little bit quicker. Now the reason that you want to trim those case necks is because your chamber has a little bit of a lip between the chamber and the lead going into the rifling. If you get that case too long and you've got your bullet seated in there, when you chamber that case, you're driving that neck beyond the chamber into the lead and it can compress that neck down and grip that bullet tighter and you can have a great increase in pressure and you can cause all kinds of problems. You could even cause a catastrophic failure. So it's really important to make sure that that brass is trimmed back so it does not extend beyond the chamber neck. So measure it with your caliper, check it versus the maximum length. If it's beyond the maximum length or at the maximum length, then I would suggest you trim it back. You don't need to go all the way back to the trim two, but you need to keep it below maximum length. I suggest going back to the trim two because it means you will have to trim, deburr, and chamfer less often than if you just bump it back a little bit each time. But you definitely want to check the overall length on those cases during each preparation for reloading. Our next question comes from Brian. Brian asks, my next purchase will be a Kestrel wind meter. Do you recommend a cheaper Kestrel and manually inputting the data into the ballistics app or buying the Kestrel with the applied ballistics software or something else? Well, Brian, I've got two Kestrels here. The first one is the Kestrel 2500 NV. This was the first Kestrel that I bought when I got back into precision rifle shooting. And the other one is the new Kestrel applied ballistics model. Uh, this is the Cadillac of Kestrels right now, in my opinion. It does pretty much everything you need a weather meter to do, and it has an integrated ballistic computer using the Brian Litz applied ballistics formulas in it. It also ha comes with software that has the Brian Litz BCs loaded into that library. So you can go through and you can pull the BCs correctly when you create a cartridge to load into the Kestrel. This thing has a ton of features in it. It's Bluetooth enabled, has 
all kinds of stuff that you can do with it. Uh, different user configurable screens, you can load different guns into it, you can load different cartridges into it. Just lots of stuff you can do with it. But all that comes at a price. The Kestrel 2500 NV really I think is the lowest model that has the features that you'll want to be able to input into your ballistic data. Uh, it has has barometric pressure, has altitude, has wind speed, has temperature. And really those are the big ones to be able to calculate into your ballistic computer. It does not do density altitude, but if you have a ballistic computer, you don't really need to do density altitude because the ballistic computer will take either barometric pressure, altitude, temperature, etc., or it will take density altitude. Um, the cheap Kestrels will get the job done absolutely positively, but what I have found is that really something like the Applied Ballistics Kestrel is just more handy. It's a smaller package, instead of carrying a Kestrel and a ballistic computer, I can just carry the uh, Kestrel itself, sticks in a cargo pocket, sticks in a vest, stick in a pants pocket just fine. Uh, obviously I can measure wind with it and with really one push of the button I can get a ballistic solution. I don't have to punch in var variables into a bunch of different fields. That takes out a little bit of room for error because when you're punching in variables that you read off of this, there are several spots where you can goof. You can goof on the read, you can misread it, you can goof just as a typographical error when you're typing it in. So it, there are different areas where you can screw up. With the Kestrel, if you're setting it up at home, you take it out to the range, you let it climatize so that it's reading the correct temperatures and the correct pressures, then all you just do is plug in the distance to the target or read the range card off of it and you've got a ballistic solution. It's good to go. What I find myself doing more often, the Kestrel will allow you to set two different wind values. You can set for a correction value at say five miles per hour and 10 miles per hour and then look, just look down the ballistic table and you're good to go. You can hold it up and you can actually read the wind and get a specific ballistic solution for that wind call. It just a lot of stuff you can do with it. So it is a really, really good option, especially if you don't already have a ballistic computer. Now there are limitations to the Kestrel. Because you don't have a keypad, you don't have the entry freedom that you have with, for instance, an iPhone, it takes you a little bit longer to set up the different cartridges that you're using. Uh, it takes you a little bit longer to set up the gun data and all that. Now you can set it up on the PC at home and you can load it into the Kestrel. That goes a little bit quicker, it gives you a little bit more freedom, but it's a little bit more cumbersome I think having to hook the Kestrel up to the computer or to uh, do your Bluetooth link and all that stuff. And unfortunately there is no Mac software for it at this time. So there are, it's not a, a perfect device. It gets a little bit closer, but it's not perfect. And when you factor in the cost, what an iPhone costs, if you were purchasing an iPhone or even an iPod just to do ballistic calculations and a Kestrel, you get a little bit closer to the cost of one of the top end Kestrels. So that's what you need to think about. I still like the little handy Kestrel because it's it's quite a bit thinner even even in its hard case. Well, I guess in the hard case it ends up being about the same thickness. This thing is really durable when it's in its hard case. And again, it's less expensive. You can get into it quicker, you can get out shooting, and the Kestrel with a good piece of ballistic software either on a Android phone or an iPhone will get you excellent values just like the Kestrel Applied Ballistics. It'll get you great ballistic solutions. You can get bullets on target. So either one works, but if you're trying to go cheap, the Kestrel 2500 NV will get you what you need done. It'll get your ballistic solutions. If you want to go top end and you want to be able to have one device and one set of batteries to do it all, then the Applied Ballistics Kestrel is the way to go. Matt asks, 
Reloading for semi-auto and bolt action rifles. I know a semi-auto is harder on the brass, so should I dedicate brass for each? Well, Matt, it's really going to depend upon how you load for your bolt action rifle. I definitely dedicate brass to the semi-autos. Once brass has been shot through the semi-autos, I really don't want to try to put that back into the bolt guns. But very often what I will do for the bolt guns that are using lower pressure loads, I will shoot those through the bolt guns for maybe five or 10 cycles, and then I'll downgrade them to the semi-autos because the semi-autos are gonna bang up the brass quickest, they're gonna damage the case necks, they're gonna start tearing at the rims of the cartridges. So those are really what I use to dispose of brass. Once the brass is done going through the semi-autos, usually what will happen before I have any problems with case necks cracking or case head separation is that primer pocket will loosen up to the point they start ejecting primers in the action of the rifle. So that is usually what kills the brass for the semi-autos for me. So I will shoot it in my bolt guns first, and then I'll downgrade it to the semi-autos, and then it'll go in the scrap heap after that, and it'll get scrapped out. If you're starting off with new brass, then definitely dedicate it to one or the other and keep it with that gun uh, until you are done with it and it is it needs to be scrapped out. But I would not take brass that's been fired in the semi-autos and then keep pushing it back to the bolt guns. The reason why is the semi-auto chambers are generally a little looser. The semi-auto will damage the brass a little bit more. You'll start to get uh, ejector swipe a little bit more often. You'll start to get bends in the case rims. And getting all that stuff back into shape and crushing it down full length sizing it to get it back for the bolt guns is just going to put more wear on the brass. So I think it's better less wear if you just run it through the gas guns until it's done than if you're trying to bounce all the way back to specs to run in a tight chambered bolt gun and then kick them back down to the semi-auto again. So that's how I do it. There's really no right or wrong way to it, but I think you're going to get longer brass life if you either dedicate it or go from bolt gun and then downgrade it from the bolt gun to the semi-auto and keep it with the semi-auto until the end of its life. Our last question comes from Alex. Alex asks, I have a Remington 700. How can you make the bolt smoother? I'm having a very sticky bolt and I've tried everything. Please help. Well, Alex, we really haven't done anything to any of the bolts on our 700s to make them smoother. Just practice dry firing is what's going to smooth that action out. Now, please, please really refrain from getting in there and polishing anything, sanding anything, doing any of that nonsense, because what you're going to end up doing is wearing your action out sooner than you would if you just used it normally. Now, one thing that does make a vast difference in the feel of the action is what you're lubricating the action with. If you go put some sticky grease in there, then it's going to have higher friction when you're closing that action than it would if you're using a light oil. The disadvantage is light oil evaporates quicker. Um, it really doesn't protect as well as a grease does. Now there's good in between there. Uh, TW25B is what we've used for a while on the lugs of our bolt actions. And the lugs are definitely a place that you want some decent grease on. Now the body of the bolt, I will usually just put regular gun oil, either Militech 1 or um, M-Pro 7 or any of those uh, gun oils just to keep it sliding a little smoothly and mainly to protect it from corrosion. But that combined with the fairly loose tolerance between the bolt body and the bolt bore and the Remington should keep it moving smoothly. Now one other um, additive that we found that works pretty well is frog lube. Uh, frog lube slides pretty smoothly but we haven't given it an extensive time in the Remington 700s. But you can give it a try, it really doesn't build up and it's not really sticky like some of the heavier greases I've seen. Uh, it likes to slide pretty smooth and the advantage of frog lube is it likes to stay where you put it. So when you wipe it on the bolt body, you put a thin coat on the bolt body, it's going to stay there. It's not going to drip down into your trigger group, it's not going to uh, evaporate quickly. So if you want something more of a grease, give frog lube a try. Don't mix frog lube with other grease. If you have a petroleum-based grease on there, make sure you grab some carb cleaner, brake cleaner, and blow all that stuff off. 
get it all out of your action and off your bolt before you switch over to a non-petroleum grease. That's all we have for this show. We shortened it up a little bit because we actually have a whole lot more going on this week. We just finished shooting a video on Cerakote and the new XLR chassis. So we're trying to get that knocked out and out the door. Also, you know, the holidays caught up and kind of put us a little bit behind on some of our other stuff. But we're getting closer. We're trying to get more videos out in between our Mail Call Mondays so you guys have a little bit more during the week to entertain you. If you've liked our video, please make sure you like, share, and subscribe. If you have any questions or comments, leave them in the comments section below or send them to us on Facebook or Twitter. And until next time, get out and shoot!